So on behalf of the Office of Research, I'm pleased to welcome you all uh, to the research talks. Um, this uh, series is supported by the Research Support Fund and is a regular series for staff, faculty, and students on campus to learn more about the groundbreaking research underway at Waterloo. Today's session is titled, Pushing Back the Frontiers of Knowledge with Supercomputing and will include a panel presentation and discussion focusing on the impact of supercomputer Graham on big data. Shortly, we'll ask each of our three speakers to deliver their presentations about their research all tied in to the use of the supercomputer. And then we'll invite the three presenters to the front of the room and we'll have a Q&A with the audience. Before we begin, for, uh, I would like to welcome two very special guests uh, from Compute Ontario, uh, which has been a key partner in hosting Graham at Waterloo. Cindy Monroe is the Chief Financial Officer uh, with Compute Ontario, and Carolyn Fell is the Director of Communications and Stakeholder Relations. Welcome here today. We're thrilled to have you with us. Um, before we get started with our panelists, I'd like to invite Carolyn to tell us about supercomputing and the role of Graham and Compute Ontario play in this area. Hi, thank you all for being here today and thank you for the great introduction. I am gonna to refer to my notes because I'm not that slick. Um, so Compute Ontario, you might be wondering what we do. What we do is we work with universities across the province as well as teaching hospitals to make sure that researchers have the resources that they need to, as Bernie was saying, push the boundaries of innovation and of research in the province. Uh, with 42% of researchers in Canada being located in Ontario, it's really important to have a provincial layer of coordination um, to work with both the provincial government and the federal government so that they really understand the issues that are happening in the province around high performance computing. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit more about supercomputer Graham in just a few minutes. Um, but the supercomputers themselves what we coordinate is more than the actual hardware. It pertains to the network, it pertains to the storage, and most importantly, it pertains to uh, the people that actually run the systems and provide training to researchers like yourself who are just getting started in academic research computing. Um, Ontario is home to three of Canada's national centers, and in addition, there's a fourth data center at Queen's University dedicated to academic research computing. And each computing site has a unique place in Canadian innovation. So I want to tell you a little bit more about the systems themselves, and then I'll get into the importance of Graham as well. Uh, the first one I want to tell you about is HPC for Health, which is located or is a co-located system at SickKids and University Health Network. Uh, as far as we know, this is the only system of its kind in the world. It is a collaboration between two hospitals and what it does is it brings in data sets from multiple sources and if anyone here works in health research, you know that uh, coordinating data sets across hospital boundaries is hard, let alone across organizations. So they've done this and they've done this really successfully. In addition to this, very recently they added an AI layer to the computer, which means that they'll be running AI health analytics on that system, which is really exciting. Um, then also located in Toronto, there's Niagara. Niagara is Canada's largest and most powerful supercomputer. Uh, what makes Niagara really special is that it has 60,000 networked cores, which means you can actually run computations across the entire system. Um, in its test phase alone, uh, the research that was done on the system, which did run on all 60,000 cores, produced two papers that are in the process of being published and have already been recognized internationally. Um, so it's really exciting and that system is available to researchers as well. And then the Center for Advanced Computing at Queen's. This is not considered a national system, but the importance of this system, or the, the importance of that uh, consortia is that they host very specific systems for specific projects. So for example, they are the data center that coordinates with Snow Lab, which is what earned Art McDonald his Nobel Prize. So that has a unique place in the ecosystem as well. So, Getting to Graham, so right here on campus and actually right under this room, which I didn't know when we came here this morning, yeah, it's so appropriate, <laughs> is Supercomputer Graham. So Supercomputer Graham is a general purpose cluster. So it's about 30,000 cores and it really addresses the sort of the long tail of science. So research projects, big and small, run on Graham. And also right now, there is an AI layer being added to Graham. And when I say right now, I mean this week. 
they are adding GPU cores so that more AI projects can run across Gram. Um, SharkNet is the organization that runs Gram, and actually the director of technology is here with us today, John Morton. So John is the person who uh, actually makes the computer run and makes it available to Canadian researchers. So the reason I wanted to take some time to describe the different systems that are available here in Ontario for researchers is to highlight that as much as research, the way we approach research um, isn't right for every problem. There's no one size fits all. And this is why we need different systems that do different things across the research ecosystem. So our role at Compute Ontario is to work with the researchers, work with our consortia across Ontario, and work with the hospitals to make sure that all of these resources are here now and in the future. And we do this so researchers like you, like the researchers we're going to hear from today, have the tools they need to push the boundaries of innovation. Um, and after this talk, if anyone here who maybe isn't using advanced research computing is inspired to get into it, please talk to me after. The systems are free to Canadian researchers, and there is training available as well. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Our relationship with Compute Ontario is so important. Thank you so much. For okay, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce all three of our speakers. So I'm going to give bios for all three of them so you can enjoy their three presentations uninterrupted. Uh, so I'll start off with uh, Andrea Scott. Andrea is an assistant professor in systems design engineering. She's associated with MEOPAR, which is the Marine Environmental Obser Observational Prediction and Response Network, uh, and is a global water futures co-investigator. Her research involves the retrieval of sea ice observations from high resolution satellite imagery and identifying methods to assimilate this data in operational sea ice forecasting systems. She also works on the heat flux at the atmosphere sea ice interface. And this is an important driver for several physical processes that are involved in retrieval of surface information from satellite data. With increased shipping and offshore activities in the Arctic, her research is timely as changing ice conditions can pose a risk to humans and industry in the Arctic. Andrew received a PhD in mechanical engineering right here at the University of Waterloo and a master's degree in applied science mechanical engineering from McMaster and a bachelor's degree in applied science mechanical engineering again from Waterloo. Prior to appointment at Waterloo, she was a postdoctoral researcher at Environment Canada and worked for two years with Natural Resources Canada on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Our second speaker is Scott Hopkins. Uh, Scott is a physical chemistry professor and director of the Hopkins Research Laboratory right here at the University of Waterloo. His research focuses on sub-nanometer size chemical systems. Uh, in the Hopkins Laboratory, he directs a multidisciplinary research program uh, that seeks to unravel the chemistry and physics that underpin the structures and properties of nanoclusters. To do this, the Hopkins Group employs high-performance computing to model the complex structures and properties of isolated gas phase nanocluster systems. He also explores velocity map imaging, high-resolution spectroscopy, and differential mobility spectrometry. Scott received his PhD in spectroscopy from the University of New Brunswick. Prior to his appointment at Waterloo, he was a Ramsey Memorial Fellow at the University of Oxford and a University of Cambridge College lecturer. He has written more than 50 peer-reviewed articles, two books, and one book chapter. He recently received an early researcher award from the province of Ontario and has four patents. Our third speaker is Regis Pomez. Uh, Regis is a biochemistry professor at U of T and a senior scientist of molecular medicine at the Hospital for Sick Children. Uh, he's an expert in computational biophysics and has made contributions to understanding the molecular basis of proton and ion transport and membrane proteins, as well as protein self-assembly and phase separation, and has been active in the development of efficient sampling methods for molecular simulations. Ultimately, his research will help facilitate the development of useful biomimetic materials, as well as new therapeutic approaches for the treatment of various pathologies, including Alzheimer's disease, cardiovascular disease, and cystic fibrosis. A native of France, 
where you just uh, studied chemical engineering in Lyon before moving to Houston, Texas, where he obtained a PhD in theoretical chemistry. He completed postdoctoral research at Université de Montréal and at Los Alamos National Laboratory. He also held a Canada Research Chair in Physical Chemistry from 2001 to 2011. I'd like to welcome all three speakers, Andrea, Scott, and Regis, to Research Talks, and thank them for taking the time from their schedules to be here today. So to begin, each panelist will provide a brief presentation on their research. Uh, and how it links to Graham. And then at the end, we'll have them all come back up and we'll do a Q&A with the audience. So first, I'd like to invite Andrea to come up and tell her, us about her research and how supercomputing is making a difference to it. Um, so I'm going to talk about the work that we've been doing on improving knowledge of CIS conditions using satellite data and supercomputing. And this work is funded um, by MEOPAR and Environment and Climate Change Canada. Okay, so um, probably most people in this audience are aware that the um, area covered by ice in the Arctic is decreasing and that this um, creates some opportunities for shipping and natural resource extraction. But at the same time, that the ice cover is becoming harder to predict. So for example, this past spring, there were some very large ice flows that were found off the coast of Newfoundland um, and the ships that were not expecting them got stuck in this ice cover and Coast Guard had to go and um, do a search and rescue or do a rescue um, of the people that were trapped in those ships. And that was just because the dynamics um, sort of farther north basically just didn't happen. These ice arches that typically form didn't form, and that ice was able to drift downstream. So it's a little counterintuitive. You would think, you know, that with things getting warmer, you would have less ice at low latitudes, but in fact, that's not quite how it works. Um, so high-resolution satellite imagery is very important for helping us predict these kinds of events and um, these kinds of uh, rescue operations. Um, but this kind of imagery is also hard to interpret. So this little um, bit here, for example, this, um, I'm not sure you can see that. Sorry, this box here is um, taken from a synthetic aperture radar image in Hudson Strait. So Hudson Strait is the body of water that connects the North Atlantic to Hudson Bay, and it's a very dynamic region, so you can see a lot of different features. And if for something like, um, like coarser resolution satellite data is typically 25 kilometers by 25 kilometers. So you would only get, you know, maybe 20 data points in this kind of a region, right? So this is a synthetic aperture radar image. So the resolution is 50 meters by 50 meters. And you have a very rich amount of information, but it's difficult to know exactly what's going on, you know, in terms of like, what is the ice concentration in that image? So this is a very important shipping route. FedNav runs ships year-round um, to a mine here in Deception Bay, and the ships frequently get stuck in the ice. They get stuck for about 40% of the transit time quite frequently, so it's not an efficient kind of operation. So just to give you a brief idea of how we get sea ice forecasts, the basic idea is that you take satellite data and you combine it with a state from a model in, in an optimization method, and then you take that optimal state and you use that to initialize the model, the model then runs for six hours or for a six hour forecast and then you take that six hour forecast and you combine it with data that is coming in those six hours and you repeat. So the most common data that's used is coarse resolution and this is just not sufficient. So again, this is a synthetic aperture radar image off the east coast of Canada. This is off the coast of Newfoundland. You can kind of see a very faint ice eddy in this image. And you can see that there's no direct correlation between the image tones. So the light colors here, for example, are water, as are the dark tones here. Um, and that this passive microwave retrieval, which is the data that are commonly used, completely misses these features of the ice edge. This is a manual analysis of this kind of image. So what we wanted to do was to try to automate this kind of a manual analysis. And to do that, we have to learn a nonlinear mapping between what we see in that image and the ice concentration. And we used a convolutional neural network um, to do that. So basically, we split those large images into little patches and we fed them into this neural network to, un to learn this nonlinear relationship um, between the ice concentration um, and the image. So this worked fairly well. This was a set of images I had, about 20 or 30 images for the Gulf of St. Lawrence from the winter of 2013, which you guys might remember was a harsh winter. Um, and, and this is uh, the passive microwave retrieval here. You can see that it tells you that there's almost no ice in the Gulf on January 17th. The image analysis, which is the manual analysis of this image, um, tells you that there's quite a bit of ice and the CNN is able to get um, most of that ice cover. And so this is important because the heat, for many reasons, but in part also because the heat that's transferred from the ocean to the atmosphere is critically dependent on the ice cover. 
So as you can imagine, in the high Arctic, there's a very large temperature gradient between the ocean and the atmosphere. And so if you have a little opening in the ice cover, a lot of heat ends up going into the atmosphere. And um, just to, this is a, so basically what we'd like to do, if you just go back here for a second, is we'd like to use this kind of ice concentration as a bottom boundary condition in forecast models, in weather forecast models. Um, so I have another student who's been working with um, Professor Michael Waite and myself, and he's been doing these very high resolution um, simulations of the atmospheric boundary layer. Uh, so that just gives you a little bit of an idea of um, the physics. So basically what we'd like to do is to work towards, this one has a homogeneous boundary condition at the bottom so that it's all just a fixed temperature gradient, but we'd like to work towards putting in some other boundary conditions and looking at how that heat release changes the physics. Um, so I think that's it. This is just a picture that we took. Um, so I was in the Arctic doing an ice thickness survey a few years ago, and we flew over these leads. So these are these narrow openings in the ice cover, and as the plane would go over the leads, it would go up in the updraft, and then it would go down in the up, down when you went over it again. So it was a little bit like being on a roller coaster for eight hours. Um, so thank you. Thank you. The, the uh, nickel and dime tour of my research program um, is uh, essentially um, one of working at the interface between experimental chemistry, experimental physical chemistry, and computational physical chemistry. Uh, so uh, on one hand, we have uh, experimental data from our nanocluster systems uh, that are actually uh, pretty intractable uh, when, when you're just trying to deal with this manually. So we need to do uh, some computational modeling to understand what's going on. And on the other side of the coin, uh, we're looking at uh, new computational modeling techniques uh, to, to try to understand our data, and the experiments will help verify or validate some of those, those different models. Okay, so uh, basically, uh, with regard to the computing side, um, we use uh, supercomputing in sort of three different ways. Okay, so we, we map potential energy landscapes, we uh, do a high uh, level uh, quantum chemical theory to predict properties, uh, and over the last couple of years, we've started introducing some machine learning to our workforce as well. Okay. So uh, everyone here is familiar with the idea of a potential energy landscape. Here's a potential energy landscape from close to where I grew up uh, in Newfoundland. Uh, this is a gravitational potential energy landscape, obviously. And if we want to map this, uh, the, the technique that you would use would be to introduce some sort of grid uh, and you would want to visit all your different grid points to figure out what the energy is there as a function of position. Now, uh, of course, the smaller the grid size, the, the better the resolution you have. Uh, this is not particularly efficient. And if we want to do something like identify where the water is pooling on that landscape, uh, then you need to have some clever way of sampling. So we could start by just trying some sort of random walk. Oh, here's a local minimum, right? We would call that a transition state. Uh, how high does the water have to go before it flows over into the next lake, right? Here's another local minimum, and so on. Now that's not particularly efficient, so there are lots of different ways of, of trying to sample and, and map your potential energy landscape, and in fact, Rajis is uh, uh, an expert in this sort of thing. Maybe he'll tell us a little bit about that? Maybe not. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, but anyway, the point here is that a molecular potential energy surface is analogous to what you would see for a gravitational potential energy landscape. The difference, though, here we have three <coughs> dimensions that we can sort of search left, right, forward, backward, up and down. For a molecule, you have three n minus six, where n is the number of atoms, okay? And you can imagine that that's uh, gonna get you in trouble as you start having more and more atoms in your system. Uh, and in fact, scientists <coughs> being very understated have called this the curse of dimensionality, okay? So uh, the best way to describe this is with an example. So imagine we have some protein, a pretty small one with only 100 amino acid residues, and imagine all the different structures of that protein are just defined by uh, a 180 degree rotation of that amide bond, right? If we have 100 amino acid residues, that means we have 99 bonds, so there are two to the 99 conformations, okay? If we can find a new conformation every picosecond, that will take us 20 billion years to find all the structure of, of those uh, proteins, okay? 
okay? So clearly, nature doesn't do it this way. Um, we need to, to be clever in how we sample, but on top of that, if you want to map a potential energy landscape that's this complex, you need a real brute of a computer to be able to do it, right? So that's, that's what Graham does for us. The other things uh, that we do uh, are to take our uh, structures that we find in these sampling uh, searches uh, and try to improve our uh, prediction of uh, the geometry and the electronic structure so that we can predict properties. Okay? In general, if you want to increase your accuracy for your prediction, that comes at the expense of calculation time. Okay? So you can start by trying to model a cluster as if it's balls connected by springs. That can do a decent job sometimes, but ultimately if you want uh, a, a real uh, accurate calculation, you need to be including a lot of detailed quantum mechanics there. Okay? So typically we want to be up in this region, uh, and then there's this trade-off. High accuracy, slow, a lot of computational resources. Okay, so if you're looking at things in the nanocluster size regime and trying to do high level quantum chemical theory, again, you need a big group of a computer to be able to do that at a, at a high level. Okay, so over the last couple of years, um, we've started introducing some uh, machine learning to our workflow. I'm not sure if there's a formal definition of what machine learning is. Uh, so. I will say that it is a subdivision, a branch of artificial intelligence uh, that is focused on using statistical analysis, we'll say, to try to infer trends through high dimensional parameters. Okay? So the idea here is um, if you have uh, an understanding of the behavior of 19 parameters, can you predict the 20th, for example? Okay? So for us, we use this in a couple of different ways. We will use uh, machine learning uh, in conjunction with our computational results to try to classify structures and learn something about uh, the um, shape of a potential energy landscape and the dynamics of how molecules and clusters move around that surface. Uh, we also use machine learning to correlate experimental observations with properties. So in this case, uh, we would measure one property and then try to predict another or a series of others. And we also uh, try to take a lot of data on a range of different drug molecules and then use that to try to learn something about uh, the substrate that they're binding to. So basically the view is, uh, let's use all the keys that we have that fit a lock to learn what the lock actually looks like. So, um, of course, it's great to do this kind of research. Uh, I personally think that chemistry is the world's best logic puzzle. Um, so, uh, we can spend ages doing this sort of, this sort of stuff for, from an esoteric point of view, but of course, our goal at the end of the day is to actually do useful things uh, that, that we can transfer, translate into the public domain. Uh, I'll point out that uh, we have collaborations with industry partners at Pfizer, uh, at SciEx. Uh, we've recently published on some of this. Uh, this is an open access paper, so you can download that to your phone right now if you're interested in learning a bit about machine learning and chemistry. Um, we're also working on uh, some commercialization and knowledge transfer things here. Uh, we're currently developing a cloud-based service uh, in conjunction with a local mass spec company from Concord, SciEx. Uh, and uh, it turns out that some of the work that we've done with SciEx and Pfizer in terms of our machine learning side of things has resulted in a spin-off company, uh, which, as I'm a was promoter, I've decided to put the logo up there, uh, Watermine Industries, or Watermine Innovations, sorry. Um, and, uh, you know, the hope is that as we continue this research, we start putting uh, new uh, ideas out there in the public domain so that people can pick it up. So uh, that is the nickel tour of my research program uh, as it pertains to supercomputing. So I shall turn the floor over to 
I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to um, uh, tell you how we use computers and a lot of computers to learn about the chemistry of life. So this is my lab as of this summer. Uh, we're computational biophysicists. So uh, all we do in my lab is simulations. We make cartoons of uh, biomolecular systems. Um, and the reason why we do that is because ideally, um, if we had access to a full atomic resolution for all uh, biologically relevant time scales, um, we could see not only how things are happening, but from that we could deduce uh, why things are happening the way they are. So this is kind of uh, the, uh, the basic motivation for what we're doing. So uh, experiments give insight into molecular properties, but uh, their uh, resolution is limited, uh, both in times and in space. So we use computers in order to try and fill remaining gaps between the molecular scale and um, uh, uh, properties that can be measured experimentally. Um, so here's a picture of Graham. Uh, I was looking for a picture of Graham, and then the one that came up on top had Scott on it, so I thought this is perfect for this pre presentation. <laughs> so in fact, I have to credit not only Graham, but and, and other um, uh, uh, supercomputing consortia uh, in Ontario and in Canada. We use uh, as many of them as we can get our hands on. Uh, but I also have to credit Scott for introducing a lot of the stuff uh, that would be background for, for my presentation, so I won't go into that. Um, but basically, uh, our approach is grounded in, in, in chemistry, so chemists would like to know what are the states available to the system, what is their relative population, and how fast it takes, uh, how fast can you travel between them. So that's the holy grail, basically. We'll try to learn as much as we can of that uh, type of information to understand the link between structure and function of biomolecular systems. So by using simulations, so we, we really make cartoons. So, so in a typical Tom and Jerry or Bugs Bunny cartoon, you have 24 images per second. Um, uh, we need a lot more detail than that. Uh, so we have 10 to the power of 15 images per second, and actually we don't quite get to a second yet. So what you find in the literature, typically people uh, simulate systems of tens or hundreds of thousands of atoms. Um, for times of up to a, a, a microsecond, but by using, by developing better sampling algorithms, uh, by uh, developing better computer architectures, and or by using more and more computers, um, such as the ones uh, made available by uh, Compute Ontario and Cam Compute Canada, um, we can uh, expand the scale and the scope uh, of our simulations um, so currently what you'll see is that uh, there are papers with a full atomistic detail of, of solute and solvent uh, with the order of a million atoms for um, simulation times that are now flirting with the, with the millisecond. There's a few studies that are of the order of a millisecond. And what this means is that we get uh, to study processes that occur on longer and longer time scales. So on a logarithmic uh, scale, this is biological time from the femtosecond, which is our elementary time step, so the, the time separation between two consecutive frames in our cartoons. You get some examples of cartoons uh, soon uh, in my next slides. Um, and then the, 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 the challenging and the, and the fun thing with biomolecular systems is that you see different things on different time scales. So on very short time scales, you see chemical reactions, electron transfer, proton transfer, and so on. And as you go towards, you know, uh, from the pico to the nanosecond, you start seeing uh, biological molecules undergo conformational changes. Um, on longer time scales yet, you see solute permeation like ions going through channels. I'll show some examples of that. Um, and then you see uh, uh, channel, uh, channels gating, so opening and closing. You see proteins folding and aggregating and so on. So this gives you a sense as to how um, uh, experimental techniques give some insight into uh, uh, broad Time scales, but as you go to shorter and shorter time scales, uh, uh, simulations can really, can really uh, help us bridge uh, between, different, uh, between those different time scales. And that's the whole point. Okay, so um, here's, here's what happens on a 10 nanosecond time scale. Uh, this is a, an ion channel in a lipid bilayer. On that time scale, so I'm not showing water molecules, they're above and below this lipid bilayer. Um, on this time scale, you see the bilayer behaves like a, like a liquid, and it is a liquid. 
So computer, uh, computers are really good uh, at simulating liquids that have many uh, different uh, uh, possible arrangements that are approximately degenerate in energy, so they have comparable populations. And this is a big sampling problem, sampling problem but uh, computers are really good at, no offense, they're really good at doing boring, repetitive things. So that's what we use them <laughs> for. Uh, and we use uh, thousands of CPU years per year. So uh, this field has, has always been a, a one of the biggest users of, of supercomputing uh, power, historically. So if you zoom into uh, an ion channel, you see there's a lot of detail to explain and understand how um, ions bind to the narrowest parts of uh, those, uh, those channels. Um, this is a sodium channel. And these little ions going through the selectivity filter uh, are actually essential uh, every time there's an electric impulse in your body, so uh, in your nervous system or, or muscle contraction. It is due to sodium and potassium ions flowing through specialized membrane proteins that are very highly selective for them. So we need this kind of insight to understand the permeation properties uh, and the selectivity and gating and leakage and also to understand what is not working when these channels do not work. A lot of uh, diseases are associated with the malfunction of ion channels. Cystic fibrosis is one example. Um, this channel is linked to uh, epilepsy. And um, so this is the basic reasons why these ion channels, these membrane proteins, are uh, massive or uh, you know, uh, very um, uh, big targets for therapeutic uh, efforts. Okay, so we're also interested in understanding uh, the interaction of small antimicrobial peptides with, uh, again, with lipid barriers. And the motivation for this is that, as you know, um, bacteria are becoming more and more resistant to antibiotics, and there is a dire need to find new tricks. Now, nature has been doing this forever, and every living system has or uh, secretes uh, molecules that help to destroy um, uh, the, the membrane of, of, uh, uh, of uh, invaders, of, of uh, bacteria. Um, so we can, if we understood how these work, that would help us design new antibiotics. So this um, little thing here is uh, uh, indolicidin. It is a bug made by cows to protect them against bacterial and fungal in infections. And this uh, shows uh, how they can help um, compromise the integrity of a barrier. Here's another example where uh, we're trying to learn how melitin, which is the B-venom protein, uh, can uh, self-assemble uh, by lipid-mediated or via lipid-mediated interactions uh, to uh, poke holes in membranes. So uh, this is another study where we're, we're trying to understand the interplay of uh, protein association and membrane interactions um, to uh, help decipher the molecular basis for the toxicity of amyloid diseases. Uh, so amyloid uh, forming proteins are involved in neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's. Um, and uh, so this, the, the, the trajectory you just saw, the cartoon you just saw, is about 20 microseconds long. Um, uh, uh, so you might think that this is short, but it actually takes a lot of, of computer time to, uh, to get this kind of information. Um, so my last example is that we are uh, using massive computing to learn about the self-assembly and the mechanical properties of elastin, which is the um, polymeric uh, matrix protein that is responsible for the extensibility and, uh, mechanic and, and, and re elastic recoil properties of elastic tissues such as skin, arteries, um, bladder, uterus, uh, lung. And um, so these uh, proteins are very highly disordered, which is a, a, a challenge for experimental techniques, but is no, uh, uh, in principle, no obstacle to, uh, to studying by studies, uh, computational studies. Um, so these uh, proteins have the capacity to form um, to separate into a liquid phase, which in itself is fascinating because we're not used to thinking about proteins as, as a liquid. Uh, we're used to thinking of proteins in terms of uh, polymers that fall into a specific shape that determines their function, but it's now been obvious for about 20 years that a lot of proteins are disordered, at least partly disordered. 
a lot of these disordered proteins actually have a lot to do with disease, uh, such as cancer. And this is really at the other end, at the far end of the spectrum. This is a protein uh, whose function is intimately linked to its ability to remain almost maximally disordered, um, uh, even in the aggregated state, in this liquid-like state. So think of this as a, uh, a bunch of spaghetti or a, a ball of snakes. Um, so uh, gaining statistically meaningful on this uh, phase-separated state for a system of a few dozen uh, elastin-like peptides uh, was actually a very massive undertaking. It took about 4,000 CPU years just for this uh, simulation. Uh, it was carried out over 18 months, uh, of which we had to discard the first 12 months of sampling as equilibration. So, um, so was it worth it? Well, we think it was worth it because the picture we got from this uh, actually helps us bridge bet uh, between uh, experimental information that was gleaned over decades, and that led to uh, simple structural models um, uh, apparently or seemingly uh, completely inconsistent with each other. So this is a good example where the, the paradigm of, of scientists as blindfolded people trying to describe an elephant, uh, this is the trunk and this is the, uh, the tusk and so on and so forth. Um, so, so this kind of study is uh, certainly it would not be possible without massive supercomputing. Um, and uh, 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 which is allowing us to, to extend, uh, as I said, the scale and the scope of our simulations to learn about ever more complicated um, uh, biological systems. Thank you very much. We have a question up here. We have our, okay, Rebecca's going to come around. Thank you very much <clears throat> to all speakers for engaging presentations. Uh, my question is directed to Regus. And I come from the world of uh, doing um, in vitro experiments and extrapolating to the in vivo situation, okay? In vitro biochemistry experiments, for example, and the extent to which they actually mirror what's going on in vivo. And it strikes me that maybe you might have the same problem, although I could be wrong. Your computational images are stunning of how pores work, for example, of how amyloids infiltrate into the lipid bilayer of membranes. So my question is, to what extent, or how do you know that your simulation of how a sodium channel is working actually mirrors the real way in which it works in vivo? Uh, yeah, good question. So, um, uh, so whenever, so we use models, um, just like most other scientists. <laughs> our, our models happen to be computational. So whenever one uses models, there's always two stages. The first one is to validate the range of conditions in which your model applies. And once you've done that, you can then venture and try to make predictions uh, as long as you remain within the range of conditions in which you've shown your model to be valid. So, so whenever uh, possible, we try to uh, compare the quantitative information we get out of our simulations to experimental observables. Um, so in the case of ion channels, um, this is actually one case where there are single molecule measurements available from experiment. So we can directly uh, compare the flow, the rate of, of ionic flow that we compute from our simulations to uh, what is measured experimentally with, uh, uh, with uh, single channel measurements. Uh, now you can question whether those measurements, which are done in vitro, <laughs> uh, are relevant to, uh, to, to in vitro. But that's kind of the next stage. So I would say that typically what we compare our results to are um, to experiments done in vitro. Um, with, uh, you know, whenever possible, uh, we, uh, we try to ex extrapolate with, to what happens in, in, in a cell. But this is really a much larger order of magnitude. I'm wondering about the interplay of what I'll call scientific intuition with um, calculation. Um, in the case of some of you, it's physical chemistry uh, mapped upon calculations, or in other cases, more sort of geophysics mapped upon the calculations. And you can go at things with a complete brute force method and just keep as every year we get, get more uh, MIPS or whatever they're called, uh, um, more uh, calculations that can happen. 
but you also have to try and minimize your use of brute power to, to get, accomplish more, I think, by using some sorts of scientific intuition in terms of how you channel the calculations. And I was wondering how you might comment on the way you do that um, without biasing your own results, perhaps, or without um, you know, leading yourself down the wrong path. Um, so from our point of view, um, the, the slide that I showed early on with this random walk across a potential energy surface, that's, that's really not the way that we, we do these things. Uh, because um, if, if you're just trying to take a random brute force approach at solving a, a, a big chemistry problem, you're going to, it's not so much painting yourself in a corner as much as just wandering around blindly in a field, right? Um, so, so there are lots of techniques that people have, have developed over time. Um, you can use your, your generalized chemical intuition uh, for some of the problems that, that we tackle. Um, for example, we know that uh, hydrogen bonded species are going to be more preferred uh, than those that aren't in certain scenarios, right? So uh, you, can, you can input uh, a guess and then allow your your uh, computational search to to uh, look around that region of the potential energy surface, for example, to see if we can identify anything, um, and we then will will take random uh, shots around our potential energy landscape and see if we converge to to a correct answer or to something that's consistent uh, across our data. Uh, so so. We're not at the point where we can remove scientists from this job, right? So, so you know, there's there's a lot of hype around artificial intelligence. Um, the artificial intelligence that we have now isn't really artificial intelligence in the sense of what Hollywood would like us to believe, right? So artificial general intelligence would be if you had a self-thinking computer that could multitask and do lots of different uh, processes with the same, say, neural network, uh, and, and we're nowhere near that. We need a lot more computational power. We need uh, better methods of, of approaching this. But, you know, what's your definition of intelligence, right? If you can handle a big data set, infer some some uh, some path through it, some trajectory through it, and make predictions, then, you know, that, that is intelligent. It's just sort of limited, right? Um, and, and that's really where, where things stand as far as what we're doing right now. We're, we're using computers in a way that they are smart, and we're using ourselves in a way where we are smart and trying to, to interface that. So, um, yes, uh, if I may, I'd like to, to add something uh, to, to uh, the point that you raised. So, um, so likewise, I mean, I would echo what, what Scott just said that, you know, whenever possible, we use our intuition, our chemical or physical intuition to try and, and simplify or, or direct the problem as much as possible. Um, so one way of doing this is by actually uh, biasing the sampling. Um, but I would like to make the case for, uh, for brute force sampling, in, 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 which I think is it's key to be able to do brute force sampling in the most challenging cases where we do not have a roadmap. And key to this endeavor is the availability of massive computing, which has allowed us in the past 10 years to, to uh, uh, really push the envelope in terms of what kind of problems we study, basically. So, so with, the, uh, uh, with the, the, this, this, uh, uh, these uh, supercomputing consortia, in the past 10 to 12 years, we've been able to do things that we hadn't thought of doing before because it was just too far off the, the map. So, um, so, so for example, the, 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 the case, in the case of Elastin that I showed at the end, uh, we didn't know when we started that it was going to take 4,000 CPU years to, to, to complete and converge this calculation. But it was really great to have this computing power to, to get to the answer. Okay? So now that we know or we think that we know how it works, we can, we can simplify the problem um, and we can direct our sampling, but at the time we didn't. So I think, I think one of the best things that, that massive computing can do for us is, is precisely that, is to go into new directions that are uncharted. Thanks very much for the you know, interesting talks. Um, since it's uh, the furthest from my area of expertise, I wanted to ask about the Arctic ice talk. Um, I mean, I can understand how we, we sort of have a pretty good concept of the basic basis of chemistry and how we can predict how atoms move, et cetera. But to what extent can we predict 
the effects of climate change. I mean, we hear all sorts of um, unexpected things that are happening. It's happening more quickly than we thought. Um, it's having effects that perhaps we didn't predict. Uh, how close are we to being able to actually model what the effects of climate change are likely to be? Um, so I don't personally work on the coupled climate models. So what you, I think what you're thinking about is these coupled sort of atmosphere, ocean, sea ice, land surface kind of models where you sort of initialize a model like that and it runs at a fairly coarse grid resolution and you project forward um, into the future in terms of uh, what's happening. Um, I think that we're just, as we sort of increase the model resolution and, and we include more physics into those kind of parameterizations, I think it's kind of fair to say that we're finding that the systems are maybe more nonlinear than we had thought. And so that's why a lot more um, unexpected things are happening. And um, so I think that we need, you know, again, this goes back to the question of having computing power and also um, reaches this point, right, about um, sort of doing some kind of brute force simulations. Now, those are not what I would call brute force simulations because they're so very heavily, heavily parameterized, right? So um, so I think you need a combination of the very sort of detailed brute force kind of direct simulations where we solve the physical equations that we know are true directly. Um, and those ones take many, can take, you know, a year or two to run, like in the same, you know, it, you know, it can take 18 months to get a converged result. And at the same time, you also, you know, run these sort of heavily parameterized models. Um, and then ideally you use that sort of very, f like, fine scale direct method to get some kind of a parameterization that you can put into that model. So I think little by little we have a better idea, but I mean, yeah, the system is very nonlinear, so. I have a question for Reggie about the molecular dynamic simulations. You were talking about 4,000 CPU years in 18 months, and that was for uh, microsecond scale molecular dynamics? Uh, this was uh, of the order of 100 or 200 microseconds, yeah. Okay, so I believe um, doing it, I, I believe D.E. Shaw does it in hardware, yeah. and they were the first to reach millisecond or yeah. something like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, should we buy hardware? For molecular dynamics? Ha ha. Um, well, first of all, if you uh, well, first of all, it's it's extremely expensive to develop to design that hardware. They won't tell you how much it costs, but you know you can imagine chip design. You know, it's like tens of millions of dollars. Um, and yes, the simulations run faster, but they only run faster for a couple of years, and then they have to go back to the drawing board because commodity hardware has caught up with them. So, um, so in the end, I mean. Personally, I'm perfectly happy to, to use uh, Graham and other uh, <laughs> uh, public, you know, academic uh, supercomputing facilities uh, in this country because I think we can, uh, uh, basically the kind of, of power we have is not that far off. It's, it's comparable with, with what they're doing. Um, so that, I hope that helps answer, answer your question. It does. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I'd like to address this question to Scott. So one of the areas uh, that the pharmaceutical companies are, are grapp grappling with these days, of course, is uh, specificity of drug uptake. And this is particularly true for biologics, whether it be a protein or whether it be nucleic acids. And you've indicated that there's an, almost an infinite number of different conformations that a protein can exist in. And DNA is perhaps a little less that way, a little more structured. And so, my, and then, and then you have to, of course, uh, match the the protein if if it's a protein biologic that you're using with with all of the complexity on the membrane, and you have to do it in such a way that the drug, for example, is taken up specifically by cancer cells. All right, so that's the challenge. That's the holy grail in many ways. So my my question is, how can you use, or how can one use, uh, machine learning? to make that process more effective, more predictive, uh, with a more likely satisfactory outcome than we've had so far? Um, so I think there are a, a couple, couple of things to unpack uh, there. Uh, so so the, the, first, the first part of uh, a protein existing in an infinite number of, of uh, conformations, um, that, that is true if you don't consider energetics. But clearly, there are 
uh, preferred states for for all chemicals, right? So, so the the trend is to go to a low energy state, and uh, we introduce um, thermometers in our in our simulations to make sure that we're we we have some trajectory toward a global minimum structure, which would be what's useful, right? What's available in in any particular system. Uh, so, when people go about uh, designing drugs. Uh, they tend to have some idea of the structure of their target um, sometimes. Sometimes it's uh, more of a combinatorial thing where you, you do a, a huge screening across uh, you know, tons of different uh, uh, motifs and see which ones are hits or misses for uh, biological activity. Um, what we have available now that people are, are uh, starting to clue into are just gigantic databases of uh, or small molecules that uh, we know have uh, physiological activity and have been screened, right? So there are uh, databases at Pfizer, at, at Merck, et cetera, that are privileged, that, that they have for themselves, but they're also publicly available databases. And you can go to these and, and get a hold of thousands of drug structures. They tend to be uh, a, a particular um, target uh, or a particular uh, therapeutic will, will target a, a specific, um, say, receptor or, 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 or some enzyme. So um, what tends to happen when, when drug companies screen is they'll, they'll have something that they know works and then they just decorate the hell out of it, right? Put, put methyl groups here, there, everywhere, let's change hydrogens to fluorines and, and et cetera and just try to screen and see what the effect each one of these different substitutions has in terms of the effectiveness of that drug candidate. Now with that information, we can go and look and say, well, we know this, these 5,000 keys all fit that particular lock, but what's the difference between each one of those keys and how does that affect the, the ultimate result in terms of that screening? So without really knowing what the structure of the, the receptor is, or uh, how it behaves in, in terms of binding to a membrane or not. If we know that these things work to some extent, we can then troll through all of that data and see if we can't find some uh, optimal structure or some sort of trend through all of these different small molecules to say, here's where the Goldilocks zone is for, for these things. So, so that's really the, the challenge that, that we're trying to take up right now. Is, is Fair enough, but you're, you're talking about small molecule drugs. Yes. Uh, some of the big breakthroughs are going to be with proteins. In Uptake principle. of antibodies, for example, into cells. Mm -hmm. And there you have huge complexity, yep. both with the receptor and also with the, uh, with the drug. That's true. So can one use machine learning to, 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 to break that down? And In principle, yes. Uh, in practice, um, there are a few people trying this right now, uh, at least in the public domain. And I'm, I'm sure that every pharmacy company has uh, a horde of people that are trying this internally. Um, the, the issue that you run into is, is this um, challenge, the, the curse of dimensionality again, right? As the bigger you get, um, the, the more challenging it is to find the, the structures that are going to be biologically effective. Uh, some things that um, that people do are, are start from, say, uh, X-ray crystal structures, right? Th that's a solidified, crystallized version of, of a particular molecule that's maybe not necessarily biologically active, but hey, you got to start somewhere, right? So, so people will will input that, and then, you know, folks like Regis will come along and and say, okay, let's see what we can do with four millennia of supercomputing power to to try to determine what's, John, what our structure is. Don't have for <laughs> <laughs> Yet. <laughs> Yet. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. Um, we heard about how new supercomputers help you do calculations faster. How much difference in terms of magnitude uh, have you noticed in the recent years, uh, namely about Graham and other, computer, other computers that were recently made available? Sure. Um, so, I don't try to compute this on a year-to-year -year basis, but uh, let's say that the difference between before uh, these consortia were made available to us and after was of the order of, say, two to three orders of magnitude in, uh, in compute power. So this is why we were able to, um, to uh, uh, 
start considering problems that we hadn't thought of because they were just too far off the scale. Um, yeah. yeah. I would agree. Yeah. 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 I mean, I would agree. I think that the simulations that we're doing now are way bigger than what we had done, say, a few years ago um, on, on Graham. Yeah. Thanks. I'll, I'll just say it very briefly at the front. I had the pleasure of working for Wes Graham for about 20 years. Um, he passed away, unfortunately, of uh, colon cancer, I think it was, in about 1999. His research work and a lot of his work and effort was involved in encouraging innovative use of computing technologies and information and data and so on across this campus. And uh, faculties like fine arts, we were the first school with a written form of dance notation all across the campus, innovative ways of using technology. Wes would be thrilled with what you've shown this morning. Um, I continue to work with his group, it's called the Computer Systems Group, and a fellow by the name of Don Cowan is still here. Um, and we have a project also with the Global Water Futures. So I have a question for Andrea, as well as the other two. Sure. <laughs> One of the clauses in our GWF proposal required us to be in alignment with the data of reporting and collection and submission guidelines of, of that project. And it means basically they want to capture all the code, all the data, everything they would need to recreate our research processes and science and data results, yeah. I believe, as well as the output and all that stuff. And I'm curious to know, in the context of big simulations being done on Graham, what's the implication for that? And I think to the other researchers as well, chemistry and biology are two fields with common publications that often require submissions like that, a full checkpoint of what you've done. And Andrea, do you know your requirements to capture that kind of stuff? Um, so we use, for our Global Water Futures Project, we're going to use the MIT GCM, which is a publicly available um, ice ocean, well, it's supposed to be a sea ice ocean, but we'll use it for freshwater ice um, lake dynamics. Um, and then we'll force that with publicly available forcing data. And then our intention would be to make any data and outputs available to the community. So I think that's um, fairly standard. This is the first project that I've been on where there's been sort of a very explicit requirement. Um, yeah, but in the, I do find that in the ice, ocean, atmosphere, kind of in the geosciences community, um, it's different in that most of the data is available, like is publicly available. Um, so you just need to give the link to where you're getting your data, for example. Um, and a lot of the codes are also publicly available. So in that sense, it's very nice. So. So this brings to a conclusion uh, this edition of the research talks. I think the panelists have done an amazing job of highlighting the diversity of research that's been supported by Supercomputer Graham. And uh, I mean, the level of detail we can handle now is just, it's just remarkable, I think. Um, so thank you to Andrea, to Regis, and to Scott for your presentations today and your participation. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd also like to give a shout out to the staff in the Office of Research who have put so much time into organizing these sessions, in particular Janet Janes and Brenda McDonald. Uh, and I'd like to uh, say uh, that we look forward to seeing you all uh, for the research talks editions in 2019. Uh, there'll be a talk in uh, January, so keep your eyes on the Office of Research website and for the announcements that get sent out. So thanks again for your uh, uh, participation today. Thanks. Thank you.